This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. be, our text today is going to be Isaiah 55, but before we get in Isaiah 55, we're going to, we're going to take a quick look at, uh, in Romans chapter 1, and this handout that I've provided, not everything on this handout are we going to cover today, so you'll see a number of verses on, on uh, the first page that, uh, that we won't specifically refer to, but would be helpful to you if you were to do further study. And um, uh, doing the handout gives me the opportunity to highlight things for you and to provide you with a, with a few key, key notes. And let's open with prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you have to say to us today. And Lord, help us to listen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a, a couple of background concepts. Every, every single person in this room is defined by what Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2 say. And we, we need to understand repentance. I'm marching off going this way, doing my own thing. And repentance means that I realize that I'm going against what God wants. And I turn around and I go God's way. That's repentance. And in order to become a Christian... We need to understand that Christ paid the price on the cross for our sin. And we need to repent. And once we become a Christian, there's going to be periods of time in our life where we're going to need to repent again. So I want you to remember that. Let's look in Romans chapter 1. And we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 29, and we're going to go through Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. And you will find that at the top of page 1 here in the handout. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, disrespectful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, where, whosoever thou that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest dost the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, 
not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Every single one of us started out there. And God, in his grace, wants to redeem us. Isaiah 55, you can read it with a great deal of, of comfort and, and, and pleasure in what it is that God is saying he's doing. But you need to read it as well with a sense of urgency. People are dying and they're going to hell. People who have been redeemed by Christ are still suffering because they've forgotten who God is and what God wants to do for them. And even though they're in Christ, they're marching off this way. And the only hope is the grace of God and repentance. Isaiah 55 and verses 1 through 3. I'll read them. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Ye come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Verse 1. Listen up. Come and eat. Everyone who thirsteth is commanded to come. The Lord is giving a command here. He's telling you to do this. It's in the present tense. It's not for sometime by and by the future. It's for right now. And we don't get to pay a price for it. You know, the folks, they came to the food bank on Tuesday. And they, didn't, they didn't pay money to come and pick up the food. God is telling us that we don't pay for this. Now, what you and I know is that Jesus paid for it, that the cross paid for it. And uh, here we're in Isaiah 55. You'll remember Isaiah 53. And the, and the description of the price that Jesus paid on the cross. And what the Lord is providing is worthy of our desire. It's the good stuff that he's commanding us to come and enjoy. Verse 2, let your soul delight itself. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Why are you spending money for what's not good? Why are you going this way? Repent. Turn around. Go the Lord's way. Expect, accept what he's giving you. Now, this word soul, when the, when the Hebrews use the Hebrews word for this in the Old Testament. They meant everything. When, when, it, when a person died, it was a soul that died. They mean the whole person. We're commanded to stop laboring for that which doesn't satisfy. This is not a suggestion. This is a command. The banquet is not bought on your own merit. And God is promising to give each of you exactly what you need. 
Now the world and the flesh and the devil, all they offer us is, is corruption and distraction. And what God provides delights the soul, delights the whole person. Verse 3, incline your ear. Incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of David. So you're being told, you're being commanded to work hard here. You know, change your posture. Move so that you, your ear is really going to hear. You know, really work at hearing. And if you hear and respond, then your soul shall live. And this is an eternal promise. This is an eternal covenant. Because it's the fruit of the Davidic covenant. Now, we're introduced to the Davidic covenant, and, and the Davidic covenant is referred to a lot throughout the book of Isaiah. But we first see the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. And just briefly, if you'll remember, David has, has rest from the wars, and he's got this nice cedar house, and he's talking to the prophet Nathan, and David says, here I am in the cedar house, and in the the Lord's tabernacle is this this old tent over here, and I will build a house for the Lord. I'll build a temple for the Lord, and and Nathan basically says, "Yeah, that's that's a good idea. I'm sure the Lord's going to bless it." And then then Nathan goes home. And that evening, the Lord comes to the prophet Nathan and says, you know, you got to go back and, and you got to tell David different. You know, I've never, the Lord's saying, I've never demanded a house. And David's not going to be able to build a house. But the Lord says, he's going to build a house for David. And, and Nathan goes back to David and, and gives him the message from the Lord. The Lord is saying to David, I'm going to build a house for you. And the kingship of your family is going to be eternal. I'm going to put a, th uh, a, a king on the throne who's a descendant of you, David, who is going to rule forever. And we know that that descendant is Jesus. David is overwhelmed. First thing he does is he just goes goes into the 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 tabernacle and he he just sits before the Lord. And when he responds to the Lord in prayer, David gets it. He understands how enormous what the Lord is saying is. And David acknowledges the importance of the people of Israel. Uh, David acknowledges God's purpose in this. And David agrees with the Lord that the Lord is going to bring this about. And over and over we see that he gets it. We see that salvation comes through this kingship that a descendant of his is going to have. As we, look at, as we look at the Psalms, as we look at what David said. So this eternal covenant is being referred to here in verse 3. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Now, we need a sense of urgency. And so I've taken this particular illustration from a commentary um, on the book of Isaiah from a scholar who's wanting to communicate to us the urgency that we should sense right now in Isaiah 55. 
There was a flood. A mother, a son, and a daughter are clinging to the upper branches of a large tree surrounded by raging flood waters. The rescue team in a boat cannot get right up to the tree because of debris, but the distance between the boat and the tree can be jumped with effort. The team and the boat shout with urgency, jump, jump, but the family members are afraid. Finally, summoning up courage, the son jumps and lands safely in the boat. Then the daughter jumps. She falls into the water, but the rescuers are ready and quickly pull her into the boat. Now the rescuers, along with the son and daughter, plead with the mother, jump, jump, you can do it. We'll catch you if you fall short. There is an, a compelling urgency in the invitation, but she is afraid and as she debates whether to jump or remain in the apparent safety of the tree, there's a terrible crack. The tree falls, and she is swept away with it. Seek the Lord while he may be found. What are you laboring for that won't satisfy? How can you turn your labor, and your heart's desire to what the Lord wants to freely give you. Change your posture. Incline your ear. Hear what the Lord wants to tell you through his word. You need to spend daily time in systematic Bible study so that you can hear what the Lord wants to tell you. Now, we are going to see that Isaiah 55 describes the restoration of all creation. The restoration of all creation is taking place because Jesus paid the price, as described in Isaiah 53. How are we going to go about the process of seeking the Savior? What does repentance have to do with your future life? Verses 4 through 7, you must return unto the Lord because God has provided a Savior. Verse 4, God has given the Savior. Behold, I have given him for witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. God has given Jesus, who is the son of David. And Jesus is a witness to the people. Now, what does this word witness mean? Well, in one sense, Jesus is a witness to the nations and to the Jewish nation of who God is. But another sense of the Hebrew word, Jesus is a judge. Jesus is the appropriate and right judge of the nation of Israel and judge of the peoples of all the nations of the world. Now, Jesus is a leader to the people. He is the commander. Jesus is the only person worthy to be the king of the universe and to be the king of this world and all the peoples of this world. Now, during the millennium, world government is going to be restored to our Savior. And we're going we're gonna to see this. All nations shall turn to the worship of the Holy One of Israel, and the nation of Israel will be honored for, for God's sake. Verse 6, Seek the Lord. <clears throat> Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Verse 6 says that right now he can be found. And verse 6 says that he is near to us. 
Verse 2 and 3 had already told us that we needed to work to hear him. Now we're being told he's here. 2 Corinthians 6 2, I'm just going to quote it. And 2 Corinthians 6 2 is a quotation from Isaiah 49 8. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 7 is exactly a definition of repentance. This is repentance. Return unto the Lord. Each of us has had wicked ways that we must forsake. And our thoughts need to be cleaned up. We need Isaiah 55, 7 repentance every day of our lives. God promises mercy. And the pardon promised to each of us, if we'll turn to him in repentance, is abundant. Now, this this actually um, years ago, I was living in uh, Everett, Washington, working for the Boeing company. And when I had time on on Saturdays, I'd go to this little restaurant and uh, and have breakfast. And one day I came into the restaurant and the mood was very somber. And I sat down and I ordered breakfast and I began to eat and I'd hear the conversation around me and was able to put together why, why everyone was, was so somber and what was going on. Um, one, of the, one of the ladies that, uh, that worked there had died very early that morning, and uh, one of the people that was in the in the restaurant was her uncle, and uh, and this lady had had been driving out in the country, uh, and she had driven off the road with her car and and died, and her uncle was saying that he had he had just been talking to her and pleading with her about her her driving drunk. And that she'd promised to change. Um, now is the time of salvation. You may not have tomorrow. Your heart will never be more responsive to what the Lord wants you to do than it is today. God is going somewhere. Are you going there with him? Are you listening to his witness of truth? Is he your leader? Is he your commander? You need to grab on to his mercy and his pardon. Your future and your present are intertwined. When God says he is going to do something, the accomplishment is a certainty. Do you see the world around you not only through the eyes of the present, but also through the lens of the future that God promises. Verses 8 through 13, Return unto the Lord, because God restores all of creation. And I'll start by reading that section. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, 
that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Now, a short overview of the relationship of some of the pieces of this psalm, starting with verses 6 and 7. And on the handout, you'll find, uh, you'll find this information in the left-hand column. Verses 6 and 7 shows you how you seek the Lord with repentance. Verses 8 and 9 show why repentance is necessary. Verses 10 and 11 shows you that God's word makes repentance possible. And verses 12 through 13 shows you God's restored universe. Two of the attributes of God are transcendence and eminence. Eminence means God is involved with this world. God is speaking these words to us. These, this is God's word we're reading. And God is giving us a command. He can be found. He's present. He's near. That's God's eminence. God's transcendence is that he's so much greater than we are that we, we can't take it all in. It be you know far beyond our minds is the greatness of God, and He can do anything He chooses, and anything He says will come to pass. The greatness of God is God's transcendence far beyond anything that we can ma- imagine or ever be. But God's eminence is He, he chooses to be found. He chooses to be close to us. He chooses to talk to us with these words. Now God made himself imminent in verses 1 through 3 as he was commanding us. But in verses 8 and 9, he's going to remind us of his greatness, of his unlimited transcendence. So in verses 8 and 9, the nature of God contrasted to the nature of man. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So, Our understanding, your understanding, is not the measure of what God can do. Only God can restore our thinking. Only God can help us to stop going this way and to repent and to go his way. If you're living independent of God, then you're living in that Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2 way that we, that we started with. In verses 10 and 11, God's word makes the whole universe prosper. Verses 10 through 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. 
It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So rain and snow are essential to water the earth. You know, don't we wish that we'd get some rain right now? Water allows the growth of seed for the future and food for the present. God's word works the same way, providing prosperity for right now and for the future. God's word is absolutely dependable. God's word prospers. Mean, that means that your mind and your heart and your soul are restored. You live a fruitful life. Verse 12 celebrates the restoration of the universe. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. You walk with joy and peace. The mountains sing with joy, and the trees of the field clap their hands. Verse 13. God's restored universe. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Thorns and briars were the consequence of sin. The restored earth honors the Lord. And this restoration is eternal. It's indestructible. A preacher told a story, a true story, and um, one of my seminary textbooks, you know, he's the author, and he, uh, he wrote it, and I'm going to read it to you just the way he said it. After the cruelty and selfishness of a 37-year-old man had forced his wife and children from his home, he called in desperation, wanting my aid in getting them to return. I said I would try to help if he agreed to get counseling for his problems. He agreed and came to the church office several days later. He brought a Bible with him, and I could not help but notice how strange it was to see this abusive man with a Bible under his arm. I had seen him many times before. He even attended our church occasionally, but I had never seen him with a Bible. Yet here, in the darkest hour of his life, he thought he would find wisdom and aid in a book written thousands of years ago. No doubt his thinking was colored by a desire to impress me, and he undoubtedly had little actual knowledge of how to discern what the Bible required of him. Still, I found it striking that I and all expository preachers shared something profoundly spiritual with this desperate man. An instinctive faith that the Bible has something to say about the deepest needs of our lives and can truly provide for them. God's thoughts are not yours. God's ways are not yours. But God has chosen to share his ways and his thoughts with you through his word. Are you listening? God's word accomplishes what he pleases. God's word will restore you. Like rain and snow waters the plants. Is your soul prospering because God's abundant supply? God chose his kindness to you in Isaiah 53. Or in Isaiah 55 as well. Now, there, there was a flood. 
A mother, a son, and a daughter are clinging to the upper branch of a large tree surrounded by raging floodwaters. The rescue team in a boat cannot get right up to the tree because of debris. But the distance between the boat and the tree can be jumped with effort. The team and the boat shout with urgency. And we have the mother and the tree and the team and the boat and the son and the daughter shouting to the mother. And they're, and they're saying, jump, you can do it, we'll catch you. God has shown you in Isaiah 55 the greatness of the banquet, the greatness of eternal rescue. He is providing for you. If you are like that woman clinging to the tree branch, then you need to make a choice. What will the ending of your story be? Lord God, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your greatness, for your transcendence, that even though we're not adequate to take care of ourselves, you are. Thank you that you choose to talk to us. Thank you for your greatness. Thank you that your word will accomplish your purpose and that you've given your word to us. Lord, I pray that we will incline our ears, that we'll hear, and that we will um, be the people that you've called us to be. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.